Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Bank of America, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Trorig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Antares Investment Partners, Arbor Realty Trust, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Jackson Development Group, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Sutfin Properties, The Wickhoff Organization, Extreme Construction and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stoll, a host of the Stoller Report, real estate trends in the tri-state region. I love Brooklyn. I'm biased. I grew up in Brooklyn. I still love going to Brooklyn. I love to go all over. And when I go through Brooklyn, I can go to developments being done by every one of these guys sitting over here today. My guest today includes Tom Lydon, president of the City Investment Fund, Mitch Rutter, uh, principal of um, Essex Capital Partners, and last but definitely not least, the grand poopa of Douglaston Development and Levine Builders, Jeff Levine. So you're, you're developing in Sheepshead Bay. You hope to develop in Coney Island. You're developing in downtown Brooklyn, Park Slope, and Williamsburg. You're developing uh, this small thing called the Edge in Williamsburg. So what's happening? Tell me about the residential development, Jeffrey. You know, you, you were talking prior to the show about you went Saturday night to, to Williamsburg. Tell my audience about what's going on in Williamsburg. Well, from our perspective, Williamsburg and Brooklyn have become the destination of choice, not the second choice, but the first choice for many young buyers and renters. The reality is that in their lack of ability to afford much of what's happened in Manhattan where prices for condominiums are approaching fourteen and fifteen hundred dollars a foot as a base where rentals are north of sixty five and seventy dollars in new construction as a base people are looking towards Brooklyn which is where they actually want to live and why do they actually want to live there because because you and I were born there? I, I was born there. My father was born there. It's a wonderful place. But in today's Brooklyn, you know, it was an old ad that uh, for Oldsmobile, actually, which unfortunately Oldsmobile failed and the ad failed. But the ad went something like, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. Well, this is not my father's Williamsburg. The reality is that Williamsburg has what, what I call the echo boom or Generation X desires, whereas we baby boomers who are now approaching almost retirement age in many cases, Speak those born, for those born in 45 and 50 are getting into the early 60s and some a little bit past that. And the reality is those people may want the Il Molino restaurant. They may want, and forgive me about Il Molino, it's a wonderful restaurant. They may want that French gourmet on the Upper East Side. Young people are looking to the Asian fusion of Williamsburg, so to the diner Tell my fair. audience about what you did this Saturday night in So I will tell you, this what, what past Saturday did. night, I went out to dinner with a dear friend and their wives, um, who happens to be in the restaurant business, David Swinghammer, and we went to the first restaurant in Williamsburg to be given a Michelin star, Dressler's. I hope they'll now comp me at least a drink when I go the next night for the promote. <laughs> but having said that, we had a wonderful dinner in a wonderful restaurant on Broadway in Williamsburg on a cold night in Friday in December. After that, we went down Bedford Avenue where we had a wonderful 
cappuccino and dessert at Fabian's, a wonderful little cafe on the corner the of walking, the walking uh, advertisement for uh, Absolutely. I am, a, I am a walking placard for Williamsburg. After which, we went someplace where we frankly didn't belong because we could have been the parents of all of the young people in a spectacular restaurant called C, which is about a 10 to a 12,000 square foot high ceiling space where they do over 1,200 dinners on almost any given night. It is an Asian fusion restaurant. You walk in, it's got a pond, a Buddha, hip finishes, young people like you've never seen, lining up in the cold of winter to get inside. So there's an energy in Williamsburg that doesn't exist, in my opinion, in most places, even in Manhattan. The Lower East Side may have that young people's scene. But, but, but I want to, and I agree, I, I, because yeah. I think Williamsburg has more than Peter Luger's mm -hmm. and what has happened. Peter but, Luger's is old school already. That's correct, but Mitch, you're building in Williamsburg. Tell me what you're building in Williamsburg. We're on Berry and North 10th. We're a block inland from Jeff's job. And what we've been able to do is put together two corners on both sides of Berry. So we'll be able to create a certain feel and look on both sides of the street. And we're going to be constructing, uh, it's almost new to look old. You know, we're proud of our facade treatments. Uh, we're going to make a building look and feel like an industrial job, loft like, and cater to the people that Jeffrey's describing. The bohemian, young bohemians? You know, the, I love going and looking at the jobs because Williamsburg has for me the feel that Tribeca had in the, in the 80s when I was in, in law school at, at NYU. And notwithstanding the great restaurants that are there, I'm still able to go to the local Ukrainian restaurants within Williamsburg that are scattered between these big restaurants and have blintzes and ethnic foods. It's really a special place now. But aren't we building too many units? You're, you, how many units are you building? We're at about 100 units. And you're building, what, 1,000? Our first phase is 1,000 units. First the phase, and what's your second phase? And another 550 units. So you have five, 1,550 units. Absolutely. It, plus affordable, or is that including and the includes, affordable? We have basically 1,000 units or 1,100 units of market rate condominiums, 375 units of moderate income rentals. And I love it when everybody is concerned about the overbuilding of New York City. I mean, if you take a step back and look at the numbers, and by New York City, I talk about Manhattan as well as the boroughs. Um, in Brooklyn, in New York City in general, we have 25,000 units of housing that are permitted to be built. They're not all finished in a given year. They take time to deliver. 25,000 units of housing in a city that has a housing stock that in many cases is 100 years old, in a city that has 8.2 million people that we recognize by census. God knows how many we actually have. Having said that, I think that our ability to supply in New York because of the barriers to creation, whether it's the entitlement issue, whether it's the staging and logistics of building in specifically Manhattan, I believe that we don't begin to satisfy the thirst for housing that we have in New York. And while we have been subject to the vagaries of the marketplace, it is a cyclical industry housing, New York has for the most part, New York City, has been less impacted than any other part of the country because of the great demand of people to live in what I think is the number one city, certainly in America, maybe the world, but the fact that we have so little supply to satisfy that demand. Okay, and with regard to that, you know, you have a major development site in Coney Island, which growing up right near Coney Island, going to junior high school in Coney Island, I know Coney Island rather well. And Coney Island's been destitute. I mean, you go there, it still looks like a slum in many. I mean, it, we had a show the week before in the Bronx, parts of Coney Island look like that. That's right, and that's where the opportunity lies. Just to finish on Williamsburg, to reiterate there, Williamsburg's just in the beginning of its resurgence. Right now, the waterfront is really still all broken down piers and things, but part of the rezoning there required the developers to build a waterfront walkway, and there's a park. So it's only going to get better. So you may have, maybe absorption won't be 500 units a year, but over the long term, it's going to do but well. But you've got a beach. 
We you got, got a beach. you got the beach. You Coney got the Island Hamptons. Got a beach, but you're you're the, the same beach as the Hamptons, yeah, right? I can get to Williamsburg. If you go, if you go far three enough minutes, down, right. sure. There's three a, minutes on the L train. There's a big you difference. You tell me how long it takes to get to Coney Island. It takes an hour, unless they get an express train in there. It takes, a, you know, 45 minutes on the bus if you don't break down on the Guanas. Big difference. Totally different market you're appealing to. It's not hip at all. I don't think the, any of the, the Y generation or the X generation are there yeah, except for the too, summertime. But you're not too far, and you remember last year you were on the show, we talked about uh, Sheepshead Bay, which you do also doing development. I mean, Sheepshead how Bay far is, a, is your Sheepshead Bay development from you, Cornelius? Two miles, and a, and a world of difference. Two miles and a world of difference. Sheepshead Bay, Brighton Beach, that area has a very established population, mostly Eastern European by background, established retail facilities, social facilities, religious facilities and a culture you know, that's until itself that people want to be there. So, so, so what's going to happen in Coney Island? Coney I mean, Island, I hear all these... Coney you know, Island is going through a, a rezoning, and the city has been the main pusher of that rezoning starting approximately three years ago. It's coming to a head. The vision is out there. The city is going public. There are different development plans. There's three major owners of property uh, surrounding it's a total of 42 acres that's going to be rezoned. And the end result and it's probably two years from now, after you go through the rezoning, Euler, and whatever else requirements that, that the city requires, is that you're going to have zoned land for high-rise construction, retail development, and community facilities, and if the city gets its way, a an opportunity to build a world-class entertainment type of amusement area. And if that all happens at the same time, and, P and more than one developer starts construction, I think that you can change over the image and, and what people think about Coney Island because there's very little waterfront land available. So if you can build buildings of a reasonable height and give them ocean views and looking back toward Manhattan, you can see Manhattan from just really the top deck of, of Keyspan Park. So there are some natural attributes. There are some negatives. You've got to overcome those. But I was out in Santa Monica, California about a month ago. I was looking at pictures of these wonderful high-rise projects that are there 20 years ago, and it was all abandoned type of properties. So Coney Island's totally different. It's really where Williamsburg was 20 years ago or where Newport City was 25 years ago. When you're looking at, But through right planning, through good development, through you know the growth in the city and the need for housing, you can build and make money building houses and probably still have it, you know, fit in with the population. So you have, people have want to come to Coney Island. There's a big push from Brighton Beach, Sheepshead Bay for people who are moving out of there for, you know, housing that offers value. You can't sell at the prices these guys are going to sell out there. You've got to sell something that offers a discount. You know, let, let's let's talk about that. You're going to be selling your units at 850 a foot, you said. No, we are expecting to average on the market rate condominiums somewhere in the vicinity $950 a foot. Mitch? We'll be at 750 to 800 a foot. And what would you Two get? years from now, I would be very happy to sell product at 650 to 700 a foot. The question is, will people buy for 650 to $700 a foot? Two years from now, if we have economic growth, okay, if we have economic growth, uh, Jeff's resales are going to go at 1,100 a foot, 1,200 a foot, you know, Mitch's products can go at 900, and you have to have relative value. You can't right. sell at the same price. And we are selling, let's say, if you want to look at a 30 story building, the top 10 floors with ocean views might sell at prices, but you got to realize you're not going to have everyone who's going to buy out there. And it the all depends upon what you're offering and where you are. Obviously, you see with three slightly different locations, three entirely different prices. What we're doing in Williamsburg, we are creating a lifestyle for young people. Not only do we have a complex of buildings with a retail spine running through it down to the esplanade of which Tom spoke, but a waterfront pier, a state park of seven acres to our north, supplemental open space, all tying into North 6th Street, just three blocks from the L train on Bedford Avenue. So there's a lot to be said for what we're doing over there. But in the same manner, uh, Mitch, you just finished the project in Brooklyn Heights, which is downtown Brooklyn. I mean, Tom, you, you just, with this, uh, you know, with S.L. Green, you just bought it, uh, an office building not too far on Court not Street. Not too far away from uh, From the, the situation. 
what's happening in the, and there was so much residential development plan and I'd like your thoughts on it both of you uh, what's happening in downtown Brooklyn with the residential construction Mitch you know we completed construction of a rental job it was built to be a rental uh, we completed that in May and we had we're 100 percent uh, rented we were 100 percent rented by September we're getting forty nine dollars a foot average in a for, for my viewers what does that amount to for a one bedroom and a two bedroom you know our average our units were were designed uh, very very uh, uh, small in a way very efficiently is the right way to put it uh, so I would say that our one bedrooms are uh, five hundred and twenty feet so um, you know, we're getting uh, close to two thousand a month uh, for a one bedroom for a one and bedroom. a two bedroom. What twenty eight hundred dollars? That's right, and we we have a few uh, uh, ground floor units duplex down to a a a basement level with an exit onto the garden, and we we are getting close to four thousand a month for those. And um, uh, the but, building but, the well, building but, has very very uh, but, few amenities. You know, Jeff, you, you you've developed all over in your career in, in New York and in Brooklyn. I didn't see Jeff Levine as one of the guys building in downtown Brooklyn residential. Why not? We all have limited resources with which to pursue development opportunities. Don't give me the limited resources. <laughs> and having said I, that, I, I, I want the reality. The, the, limited reality resources is, the reality is that I love Williamsburg. I don't necessarily love, forgive me, Tom, Coney Island because of the barriers to creation there, so the entitlement. Downtown distance. Brooklyn. This week, Josh Musk just signed uh, Morton's. Uh, Morton's is going to be in the, uh, the Marriott of the Brooklyn Bridge. And Josh has done an incredible job with the Marriott and with his development over there. Um, I, on the other hand, do not see the buying public that I am striving to satisfy. The young people who I want to sell to are attracted to the amenities, the lifestyle of a place like Williamsburg, of a place like the Lower East Side. I do not believe that downtown Brooklyn, while it does have some very positive aspects on its side, it is well located with regard to transportation. It's an easy community. I mean, you don't live with the L train and right. the, and, and the water uh, taxi. I said, that's a positive. On the other hand, the type of amenities that exist there for young people in terms of nightlife, in terms of social activities, are not, in my opinion, on a par with what I see in a place like Williamsburg. I mean, I think, again, it doesn't mean downtown Brooklyn is bad. No, no I'm, I'm just trying just, to been some I, I, will, I will say this. We went into downtown Brooklyn. I want to make two points. One, we almost, we made our way into downtown Brooklyn almost by accident. You know, we're commercial investors in Manhattan traditionally. And... Uh, in chasing returns as prices started to ramp up in the city, we came upon something that was opportunistic for us. Uh, and on a rental basis, when everyone around us was building condominiums, uh, it, it made sense. Uh, I will say that, um, that I believe, particularly in downtown Brooklyn, uh, where there's a, uh, a huge inflow now of rental product, I think rents are gonna flatten. Uh, I'm not sure that's a uh, an area of of uh, rental growth, but I but, but to just take exception with one thing you said, um, I clearly agree that downtown Brooklyn is not gritty like Williamsburg, and it doesn't have that edge. On the other hand, uh, you know when you uh, go into uh, the heart of Brooklyn Heights, the restaurants, the uh, we weren't talking the, about Brooklyn Heights. <laughs> Which is close by now, Mitch. You achieved rents there substantially above what you thought you were going to achieve because we looked at that's right I, with you, and it was maybe mid thirties, high thirties. Right, where thirty six a foot is where I had originally right. well, projected. I, I those think rents. what we're talking about really is the overall growth of rents in New York City in general. You know, as a condominium market was heating up in this real estate, what we're now calling a bubble. Basically, people were forced away from the decision to buy condominiums because of the high prices going back about two years ago now, and that drove people towards the rental alternative. And rents in New York, which had been topping off at, say, $55 a foot, surged in many places to as high as 75 in, in Manhattan. In Manhattan. In okay, Manhattan. so, uh, you know, frankly, the boroughs, whether it be Brooklyn or Queens, their leasing rates for residential units are a, a, a shadow of the Manhattan right. rents. And I think what's happened with this all negative psychological talk about the real estate bubble bursting, even though it really hasn't actually happened in New York City, it has caused people to look and 
buy real estate on what they think are lower prices now because of what they perceive to be a weakness in the condominium market. Mm -hmm. And I think they're smart to buy because, again, I don't see a lot of product coming forward with the liquidity crisis we have now in financing, with the expiration of the 421A. So I think people did start to buy again. And as a result of the fact, they left to some degree the rental market. And you're starting to see a little bit of softness in that rental market because of that. What, what's happening with the sales market? I mean, your, your development in Williamsburg, you're not ready to sell yet. You, That's right. And, and, you're, and you're not ready at the... We will be opening our sales uh, office on North 6th Street and Kent, immediately adjacent to our site in uh, March or April. Right, Fine. We're going to be in June. Fine, that's but right. that, that's so. What's happening now with the other developments? You have you have this big Toll Brothers development. You have Twenty Bayard. You have a lot of small developments uh, all around Williamsburg. Um, how are they doing? I mean, the well, I mean, Toll I think is fifty to sixty percent sold. I think no, they're over they're over sixty percent sold to my knowledge. At prices approaching nine hundred dollars a foot in a waterfront project. Um, they are a good comp for us. I, of course, believe that our product will be superior. I believe our timing will be better. The subprime what, issue what, what, has what impacted this. What are resales sales. selling at Schaefer's Landing? Well, Schaefer Landing is not my Williamsburg. You know, no. Dis Wait a second. <laughs> Isn't it Williamsburg? I, I mean, well, listen. I, there are three Williamsburgs. There are three Williamsburgs. Oh, it's like my three Harlem's. There are three Williamsburgs. There's the South Side, which is predominantly Hasidic, and that's a separate market from the sales market we're talking about. You have Central, which is dominated, forgive the pun, by Domino Sugar, which is industrial and in the process of being rezoned by CPC Resources. And then you have the North Side. And my Williamsburg is the North Side. The North Side, fueled by the L train, fueled by the amenities of retail that existed there, whether it was the Galapagos, or whether it was the North 6th Street music venue, or the Restaurant C, or Planet High, all extraordinary places, attracted young people to live in the existing housing stocks in the upland part of Williamsburg, going from Berry to you know uh, Bedford. You uh, you're not answering my. So you, my three, answer is my answer three is Williamsburg Toll Brothers. Two, so I'm only going to talk about the north side, Sha uh, Schaefer Landing was a heavily subsidized project that sold at a very affordable price going back to the Giuliani administration designated Kaposha and Spitzer to do that but, job. But they are all market rate units. I Schaefer understand. Land. And it's sold. It's sold. There's no question it's sold. And it's what, sold. But and what the are price point, selling from there? I, I cannot answer that question definitively, but again, it's not my market area. But in, in the in the north side, <laughs> I would tell you that uh, at a job uh, a few a few blocks down from where we are, the Lucent, uh, they're achieving they're achieving prices in the in the uh, 850 range. Well, I, again, everything of quality is selling and selling reasonably well. What I mean by that is, Toll Brothers on North Side Piers is uh, in excess of 60 percent sold. And they're talking about starting their second. And they're starting phase. their second phase. Toll Brothers had another project on North Eighth Street, very interesting the contextual looks. job that I believe is. If not sold out, I think the recent ad was two units, and they were not waterfront, or they did about the park, and they were in excess, I believe, of $800 a foot. The other, they had the cabanas. Right. The other product the on the market, there are some very interesting products. Steiner has just come in, and I guess 80 Metropolitan has a wonderful presentation. Is that presentation. the old mustard factory? That was the old mustard factory. Um, they have begun construction. They have a sales office. I believe they are projecting sales in the vicinity of 850 Again, not on the water, not a high-rise mid-rise job. Um, in addition to that, there are some other very interesting jobs. We spoke with Savannah. I believe they're on about North 8th, North their 8th, project. Yeah, yeah. Um, good presentation. They are also projecting numbers between 850 and 9. What, what about people want to rent? Like, people wanted to rent the Mitch in, in depth in Brooklyn Heights. Well, the the Brooklyn. answer I can give you, unfortunately, the issue of renting in Brooklyn is the same issue as renting in Manhattan. The numbers are hard to pencil out. Right. We all know with the high cost of land predicated on the success of the condominium market, rental development in Manhattan without 80-20 tax-exempt bonds doesn't exist anymore, other than in the rare case where people are stuck in land and want to build their way out through a rental. And in Brooklyn, rents are only now getting to the level where you could even conceive it. But now financing is quite difficult, so new rentals are going to be hard to create. On the other hand, in keeping with the rezoning of Williamsburg, we do have affordability components. We are building moderate income rentals. In my particular case, we're building out 
on site the entire 375 unit moderate income rental, which will go to people who earn 80% of the area median income. Which is up to $56,000. Which is up to $56,000 a year, and that will create a great opportunity, not only to those people who are from the community and want to stay in the community and don't wish to be um, moved out, so to speak, although I must say again, the waterfront land in Williamsburg was commercial, industrial land, vacant for 50 years in many cases yeah. and never residentially used. So fortunately, we're not displacing anybody and we're creating opportunities for people within the community to relocate within the community. You know, I was saying part of the show about retail uh, and, uh, you know, Coney Island needs retail, um, downtown Brooklyn needs retail, and Williamsburg needs retail. Uh, what type of retail do you see coming into Williamsburg? And you, you have how many square feet? We have 70,000 square feet of retail on North 6th Street, which is the east-west spine of retail Williamsburg, Bedford being the northwest, the north-south spine, and North Six coming from the train station right down to the waterfront. Um, what you have in there now are boutiques, clothing stores, American Apparel is already there on North Sixth Street. Um, you have grocery stores. What we are going to be doing on our site, we're in discussions with a major gourmet grocer, which we think will be a wonderful amenity to the potential thousands of people who will be moving into these new waterfront developments. Um, we believe that the retail, in our perspective, provides an opportunity for not national retailers, but regional retailers who can't find the type of quality space they need in these existing loft and or tenement type uh, buildings. The, the, you know, the week before I did a show and we were talking about Applebee's in the Bronx. Do you see an Applebee's or Red Lobster opening up in Williamsburg? If I even thought of bringing an Applebee's <laughs> or a, lead, a Red Lobster to shot. Williamsburg, <laughs> I would shoot <laughs> myself. <laughs> it is not. But the, well, look at the broader Brooklyn where Fairway yeah. and Home Depot Absolutely. and uh, Well, Lowe's getting back to the restaurant, I don't have to look outside of Williamsburg to bring a wonderful, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Goes. To bring a restaurant in, I'm just very hyped up on this. <laughs> the restaurants from Williamsburg, I don't have to go very far. The principles of wonderful places like Diner, a little place over in Broadway that we mentioned before, they are all, would love the opportunity to be in a location such as ours on the waterfront. Well, again, you look at retail, take a small example. We're an investor in a small retail redevelopment on Atlantic uh, Avenue. Atlantic Avenue, you're right. It's third and fourth. These are existing bodega type of uh, secondary bookstores, and uh, maybe it's 10, 10 buildings with residential on top. Uh, the partners, who happen to be three women, just signed the first lease. The rents were in the 20s, and they signed their first lease in the 70s. Great. And another yeah. lease, you know, so e in Brooklyn, that's pretty close to the transportation. It's, you know, it takes, to, to, to get three guys like you to talk, 30 minutes is not enough for it. So we, we'll come back in a couple of weeks, couple of months, to talk about what's happening in Brooklyn again. But I'd like to thank Tom Lydon, Mitch Rutter, and uh, Jeff Levine. Uh, the week after, we're going to be talking to uh, REIT exec executives who have seen a, a, a big downturn on their stock prices, and they'll say what they project the market to be next year in 2008. Thank you. See you next week. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, Bank of America, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Antares Investment Partners, Arbor Realty Trust, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Jackson Development Group, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, 
Sidney Fetner Associates, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Sutfin Properties, the Wickhoff Organization, Extreme Construction and Deconstruction.